had uh, a good 4th of July. It was uh, kind of sedate, except around 2 o'clock, somebody was blowing off fireworks in my backyard. But uh, other than that, it was a very, very nice holiday. And I thought it'd be good to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, so many people are burning flags. I thought we'd salute ours. So this one is, Ken knows what this is. This is what a deceased veteran gets, and this was Donna's father's. And I would take it out and unfold it, except I would never figure out how to fold it exactly right back uh, like this. So if you'll stand, we'll go ahead and do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, I did have a letter in the paper yesterday. Oh. And the amazing thing, I mentioned God in it, you know, and they still printed it. But, uh, you know, with all the, the race issues going on, uh, with all the uh, anarchy and protests and exactly what Donna read, I thought it'd be good to have a positive letter. So this is not one of my great letters. This was, uh, I thought, one of my better ones. But it goes, learn from Smokey John Reeves. Now, Smokey John, good friend of Tolbert and mine, partners um, in our Hall of Fame, our Roy Lambs Hall of Fame, and was just uh, terrific for race relations in this city. Just, if you ever been to the Bible study at his restaurant, it still goes on. His son has continued the tradition but here's what I wrote. With July 4th here, I would like to relate a story about a friendship that is very appropriate for today. My dear friend Smokey John Reeves of barbecue fame passed away last year. We had a bond that transcended him being black and me being white. His grandparents were slaves and mine were made slaves in Russia by the communists. We met in a business deal and were close for seven years, which I wouldn't trade for anything. We could tease each other about our differences. And someday I'll tell you about some of those teasings. They're pretty funny. Uh, Jim knows what I'm talking about. Talk about life and race issues, and we would always end in prayer and gratitude for being Americans. The point is we got to know each other and realized we were both created by God for good works and to love one another. People today can learn a lot from Reeves. He raised three tremendous children who are carrying on his legacy of encouragement, gratitude, and caring for people of all colors, ethnicities and backgrounds. I miss you, my friend, and so does the city of Dallas. So that's Smokey John, and I wish, wish I could talk to him again right now with all that's going on in America. It would be interesting. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about Independence Day, um, and then we'll get back to our lesson on uh, Genesis. and. If you take your outline, Donna did a great job in this week's outline, as she usually does. Uh, and a quote from Peter Marshall, may we think of freedom not as the right to do what we please, but as the opportunity to do what's right. And then things learned June 28, 2020. Noah found favor with the Lord God Almighty because he did everything he was commanded to do, even though everyone around him was totally corrupt and mocked him daily. It's kind of like Mike Pence. He is mocked daily. 
but he does what's right. And I listened to him at First Baptist, did a magnificent job. Number two, the ark was truly an engineering marvel for its day, accommodating the family of Noah and all the species of animals that God wanted to preserve. It was truly designed supernaturally. And like I said last week, it was the largest ship built until the 1800s. Think about that. And then number three, God promises to never again destroy the earth because of sinful man. He will spare the righteous people from tribulation and will renew the earth to its pristine condition. And then page two, pray for the nation. Now, I don't usually go out of sequence here on what we learned, but what Donna said, and I didn't know she was going to read that today, by the way. Uh, she never tells me anything. I, I, <laughs> except what to do, you know. <laughs> uh, but the first thing I put of what we learned this week, and I put it here and pray for the nation, is Satan is attempting to destroy our country from within by inciting division, anger, hatred, and a twisting of the founders and the foundations of America. That's his modus operandi. That's what he is doing and having a lot of success doing it. And we have raised a generation, it seems, of indoctrinated, very spoiled millennials that, uh, if you look at these protests, are mostly Caucasians, young people, mostly women. It's incredible. Why aren't they working? Where do they get paid? I mean, it's unbelievable that you can protest for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time and have plenty of money. Uh, but that's what we learned first. The national leader, I got to hear him on the radio today, Dr. Benjamin Carson, one of my favorites. We've invited him to our Hall of Fame twice. He's uh, reluctantly uh, declined because of his obligations. It's hard to get people in cabinets and uh, running for president and things like that with security and so forth. We're just not big enough time to get, but we'd love to have him one day. And then the state of Ohio, the governor, the Senate, and in the House, one of my all-time favorites, Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan um, wrestled for Ohio State, and I'll tell you what, that guy is tenacious really like him. And then turn to page three. And these are, I thought, some interesting things about Independence Day. Uh, as you know, it was 244 years ago on July 4, 1776. But the colonies had been at war with King George for 440 days before they declared independence. It was actually adopted on July 2nd, but because of printing and so forth, it was formally adopted on July 4th with 12 of the 13 colonies. New York took 15 days. I was wondering if de Blasio was mayor back then too. And then two of the signers died 50 years to the day on uh, July 4th, 1826, and there were both presidents, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, and five years later, James Monroe died on the 4th. I don't think that's a coincidence somehow. I think that is uh, prescient. And then the most quoted, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the most quoted from the Declaration. And the 56 signers truly pledged everything they had, their lives, their treasure, 
because England viewed this as an act of treason. And so that started, obviously, the Revolutionary War. And if you think these were a bunch of uh, uh, non-believing bigots, their motto was no king but King Jesus. That was the motto of the Continental Congress. And so I also like some quotes that I just kind of perused through from the internet. Some you'll recognize, some you won't. But I thought there were interesting takes on America today. And the first one, America is not just a country, but it is a family wherein everybody is used to yelling at each other. <laughs> Freedom comes with responsibility. That's the reason that many people don't like it. It comes with responsibility. And this third one didn't happen, I was hoping it would. On the occasion of the 4th of July, let us take a break from complaining about your country on the day which celebrates your country. That didn't happen. And then just wanted you to know that fireworks look much better when you're focusing on the sky and not your phone. I tell you, when you see, <laughs> it's like a magnet. Um, I really wish Americans would get more excited about our independence than the fireworks. And then three that you'll recognize, uh, one by the great Lily Tomlin, one of my favorite comedians of all time. And she said, 98% of the adults in this country are decent, hardworking, honest Americans. It's the other lousy 2% that get all the publicity. But then again, we elected them. <laughs> and then the guy, you couldn't see him in person. He was just too foul mouthed. But if he did a TV special, you liked it. And that's uh, George Carlin. And George said, when you are born, you get a ticket to the freak show. <laughs> and when you are born in America, you get a front row seat. <laughs> and then finally, Ben Franklin, very, very uh, intelligent, wise, full of wisdom. He was the oldest signer of the uh, Declaration. He said, those who desire to give up freedom and only to gain security will not have either one. Give up freedom, desire security, you'll not have either one. So that's the 4th of July, 244 years later. Now, if you'll turn back in your outline to page three, I put a review of chapter eight, because chapter eight is a very important chapter. And we're only going to do one other chapter today, so I thought a good uh, review would be good. And in Genesis 8, 4, the ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat in Turkey. Remember this mountain range, highest peak, 16,000 feet. And now it's got a 350-foot ice cap on top of that, which is where the ark would be buried under at this point. Um, if it hasn't deteriorated. But it could have been preserved from that ice, so you never know. Genesis 8.13, the waters recede and the ground is dried up, and by the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, remember they lived a long time back then because the misty shroud prevented the sun's ultraviolet rays to penetrate and they live a long time. They didn't age like we do today. In the first year it dried up, then Noah removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. And then 8, 16, and 17, and this takes place after Noah's been on the ark for a year. God commands Noah to disembark his family and the animals and to be fruitful and multiply. 
Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase on it. And then Genesis 8, 20 and 21, first thing Noah did was show his gratitude to God and thank him for his family's salvation. Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the all clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. And then page four, beautiful picture here. That's gonna be in chapter uh, nine that we're gonna study here in just a minute. The rainbow that God puts in the sky to reinforce his covenant with mankind and as uh, Satan would have it the homosexual community has adopted that beautiful rainbow as their flag as their colors and 8 21 and 22 the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. We'll see that in today's lesson. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease, world without end. And... Uh, a lot of preachers teach that the world will be destroyed by fire. That is not correct. It is going to be renewed. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And there will be a thousand year millennial reign with Christ on the earth. So if you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9. So eight souls saved on the ark. Noah Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their wives. And that's it. So eight people are going to repopulate the earth. Verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the Hebrew word for God in this instance is Elohim. I love that title, Elohim. Verse 2, and the fear of you people. Now, the animals are, they've been pretty friendly, obviously, with Noah and his family for a year inside this ark. But God says that the fear of you and the dread of you should be upon every beast of the earth. The animals are going to fear you. And upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves on the earth, and upon the fishes of the sea, and under your hand are they delivered. God gave dominion over all the animal kingdom to mankind. Verse 3, And every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. It'll be okay for you to eat any of the creation as food, even as the green herb have I given you in all things. And, of course, the marijuana industry loves to quote that verse. <laughs> verse 4, But the flesh and the life thereof, which is the blood, the life is in the blood. And that's why Christ had to shed his blood for the remission of our sins. But the flesh with the life thereof, you shall not eat. Those animals have to be drained of their blood before you eat it, and you're not to eat blood. Now, I come from a Russian family. They ate a lot of weird stuff like blood pudding, blood sausage. Not me. I didn't have it. And it was not because I knew that verse. It just freaked me out. I just didn't want any part of it. 
And surely your blood of your lives will I require it at the hand of every beast will I require it at the hand of a man, because every man's brother will I require the life of man. God's instituting capital punishment here. Verse six, whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. God takes murder very, very seriously. Now, wartime, different thing. Self-defense, different thing. But murder, especially premeditated, cold-blooded murder, needs to have capital punishment. Verse 7, And you, be you fruitful and multiply, and bring forth abundantly in the earth, and increase therein. And God spoke to Noah and to his sons. He must have spoke verbally to Noah's family. And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth, with you and all that go out in the ark and every beast on the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood that will destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of my covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature for perpetual generations. I do set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be as a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow will be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. When God makes a promise, and the covenant, he does not ever break them. He has made a covenant with us through Christ that we're grafted in to the promise of eternal life. Verse 17, And God said to Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Now this is going to come into play big time here. These three boys, Japheth was the oldest. Uh, and of course his descendants settled Europe and Greece and most of us come from the line of Japheth. Uh, Shem was the Jewish line, the line of Christ. Ham was the uh, African culture, Egyptian culture, um, and Canaan. Now, in biblical terminology, grandsons are called sons. Okay, it's very, very common that uh, Noah would call Canaan a son. Now, he wouldn't say, that's my grandson, like we do today. And these are the three sons of Noah, and of them the whole earth was repopulated. In verse 20, and Noah began to be a husband. He planted a vineyard. Now, Noah probably had a lot of... Uh, cooped up feelings from being on that ark for a long time. So he's out there cultivating a vineyard and he is going to make some wine. 
And I don't know what kind of wine. It might have been fortified wine. <laughs> uh, I'll never forget in college, they, they were all drinking that Mogan David 2020. Mad Dog, they called it. Mad Dog. It was 40 proof. So Noah plants this vineyard. Verse 21. And he drank of the wine and was drunk. And he was uncovered inside his tent. So get the picture here. Noah gets blasted. And he passes out completely naked in his tent. Now, in those days, and probably right through now, it was not good to see your father naked. In fact, in Leviticus, it said that a man should never, ever sleep with his father's wife because it uncovers his father's nakedness. So it was almost equal as a sin. So Noah, he, you know, even though he's been abundantly blessed, his family's been saved, he decides to get plastered. Verse 22, And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and went and told his two brothers. So I guess they were shocked that their dad was passed out drunk, completely naked in his tent. And so Ham goes out to tell his brothers. Well, he probably also told Canaan because Canaan was his son. And I'm sure they all knew about it. And Shem and Japheth took a garment. So they took a coat. And they laid it both upon their shoulders and walked backward into the tent so they would not see their father's nakedness. And they covered him up. So they put their coat on Noah, who's out cold. And verse 24, and Noah awoke from his wine. So he sobered up. And he knew what his younger son had done. Now, he's either talking about Ham and Canaan, or just Canaan. The scriptures are not 100% clear on that, neither are the commentaries. But he woke up from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. So Noah is angry. He is really upset. In verse 25, and he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. So he's not upset with Ham. He's upset with Canaan. So I looked in a lot of uh, commentaries. Why did Noah curse Canaan? And this is what it said. Why did Noah curse Canaan when it was Ham who saw him naked? Why was Noah so angry that Ham saw him naked? Some proposed that Ham and or Canaan actually did something to Noah in addition to seeing him naked. The passage mentions that Noah was very angry when he found out what his youngest son had done to him. Homosexuality rape or some sort of humiliation are frequently mentioned as possibilities. One rabbinic teaching, when the rabbi teaches, is that Ham and or Canaan castrated Noah, which would have been really upsetting. However, the text nowhere states what Ham did to Noah or Canaan did to Noah. Any theory of what occurred is speculation. But the curse remained. And so Canaan eventually settled what we would call Israel today. Canaan 
settled the promised land. So when Moses leads the Exodus, which we'll, we'll study in uh, the next couple of months, God told him to destroy every Canaanite and possess the land. And that's the curse that Noah put on Canaan. So the land of milk and honey actually was settled first by Canaan and then Moses and the two and a half million Israelites conquered it, possessed it, and are in that land today. And let's see, verse uh, 26. By the way, the Canaanites were also known as the Phoenicians. I, don't, I didn't know that. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So Shem, the descendants of Shem were the Jewish people, and Canaan shall be his servant. They will conquer Canaan. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So the descendants of Japheth are very close with the Jewish people. In fact, all, most Americans are descended from Japheth. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. It's incredible. So after this incident, Noah lived 350 years. But I think the really interesting um, curses as well as covenants last. They have meaning, especially when they come through God. And then what's also, uh, I think, interesting is that uh, if you look on your outline for chapter 9, is that God said the heart of mankind is incredibly evil since birth. So one of the things we're going to learn here today is that I put God keeps his covenants and promises forever. Even though mankind is inherently evil and sins, even when blessed abundantly. We are so blessed in this country. And yet, a great many have turned their backs on God and rebelled. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be with the second coming of the Son of Man. And what we're seeing in America today is what took place in the days of Noah. And then God's ultimate plan to redeem his creation is for people to realize that they are sinners and desperately in need of a Savior. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's plan for redemption for us and for the earth. In your outline on the last pages, we've got some review of chapter 9. That God blessed them, gave them dominion over everything. He institutes capital punishment for murder. As a sign of the covenant, he put the rainbow in the sky. I think that's one of the most beautiful things uh, when you see a really distinct one that's just gorgeous. And then Genesis 9, 20 and 21, Noah gets uh, the, the vineyard going. It must have been a pretty good vintage. And uh, then the part about the nakedness and that he curses Canaan for some reason. Personally, I think it was a homosexual act. That's what I think. Catherine. Okay, so I have not studied Genesis for a while. I see the pretty rainbow, and now in my brain is rainbow equal LBGT, whatever, right? Yes. And I'm like, shoot, because the rainbow is so pretty. Yes. You said. Now, I never heard of why Noah was so mad because of all what you explained is brand new to me. So then I'm like, why, whatever commentary it was, 
it looked like it, the proof is in the pudding because they stole the rainbow. Very, very possible that that's the connection, but um, you know, the, the point was that even though Noah was, was saved and his family was saved, they still sinned. They still needed a redeemer. Donna. Isn't it possible that um, Noah didn't get drunk on purpose? Yeah. Because he thought he was going to Well, I think that's a little Pollyanna ish. I <laughs> because before the flood, there was plenty of booze flowing in Noah's time. So he knew what it was, and he grew it on purpose, and he had to know how to ferment it. I mean, it just doesn't happen. So I think he was probably hadn't had any in over a year, you know, several years probably, and uh, it hit him hard. Yeah, hit him hard. But boy, you'll pay for that answer when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's paper. I was just reading this and I was thinking, why the break the boat? But then I thought, you know, the Bible is far but a bow and arrow, you know, when you're going to shoot something because it's an anger, it's an act of war. And so instead of it being an act of war, that the rage against God, against sin, which he had to judge, now he puts the bow. And, and it's and it's, a, it, and it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful something. and it's a bridge. Yes. It's yeah. a bridge to the sinful man. Yeah. To mighty God. And I also think when, uh, you know, this whole thing about nakedness, you know, his nakedness and exposing him, I think that what I read that the Lord is telling us in this is that there's a there's a price to be paid when we uncover other people's sins. Even in this generation. I don't think God likes that. He's a, he's a God of grace and a God of mercy. And I think he wants us to cover one another. That doesn't mean we condone, but we don't run around humiliating people with their own sin. And he doesn't like opportunists. You know, that take advantage of situations like looters. That type of uh, activity, they're taking advantage, I think, of a weakness. And, uh, exploiting. Yes, yes, exploiting. Thank <coughs> right. Jerry. Uh, yes, my commentary here for that verse says, a ham gaze with satisfaction, whereas um, Shem and Japheth showed respect for their father by covering. Yes, they did. That's why they walked backwards. But something else happened. Because he said he knew what the youngest son had done to him. Now, I don't think he took magic markers and wrote, kick me on his back or something like that. Uh, it was way worse than that. For him to curse Canaan and his, all his descendants. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, Steve? I, where it says that the human heart is evil from childhood, so God created evil because as a child, you don't have, when you're born, you wouldn't learn evil. So why did he create people with evil hearts? And then. Well, here's when we studied the creation of Adam and Eve. God's intent was to have a fellowship with mankind and that they would never die and that they would never sin. But he gave everyone free will. So Adam's sin, the sin virus, infects you at birth. And you've got to have a savior, a redeemer, that can cover that sin in God's eyes. And he says, there, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. These burnt offerings and the mentioning of the blood was all looking forward to God's plan for Christ to redeem us through his shed blood. Chris? Yeah, it seems like it, uh, this is a poor analogy, but uh, the uh, sin, 
sent virus. It was a pandemic of its time. And social distancing was taken to the final limit there with Noah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good analogy. He, uh, God pretty much cleaned house and started over. Donna? So, do you think there's a correlation between the rainbow and the potential of homosexual sin? Could be. Could be. That's probably one of the reasons they pick it. That's easy. Kenny? Is there any estimate historically how many thousand years ago the flood occurred? Yeah, we were talking about that last week, Debbie and I, um, about the age of the flood. If you go through all the descendants from Adam through Noah, we figured it was, what, 7,000 7, years? I mean, from, from now. Approximately 6,000 years ago. Okay, so that being the case, and uh, according to uh, Genesis, the world was populated by Noah and his family. Correct. And we're to believe that the black race evolved in six thousand less than six thousand years. Well, Ham, the the name Ham means sun burn. Remember, these these were Semitic people. He was very dark skinned. Ham was. But he was the son of Noah, right? Correct. But Noah was also probably somewhat dark-skinned as well. Because when you look at uh, the Jewish people, they're, they're, they're closer to um, Egyptians than Africans, right? And there are certain cultures, especially in, in far-out places that have over time adapted to, and they've gotten darker because of the sun. Yes. So we are white because we come from Europe where there is not much sun. So Jacob. we lost all that melanin and so on. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you go out and lay in the sun for a couple of days, you turn pretty dark. <laughs> pretty red, I assume. Anyone else? Before, like, the rainbow came about because of the diversity, like many colors, many genders, many people equal in one, because... Well, there's only the, two genders. I know, but that's what the flag means. And so I don't think there's any connection. I mean, spiritually it could be, but they actually, during the Nazi in Germany, Hitler would put a pink triangle on the clothes of gay people to identify them. So a pink triangle is actually the sign of homosexuality for them. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, it wasn't just the Jews he was after. He was after the gypsies, the homosexual. He was after them all. There are uh, the places in Africa, in Ethiopia, I believe, near Lalabella, maybe some other, some cities that have or communities that have been found to have black people who are speaking Hebrew and they've been just um, isolated for years and years and years. And some people think of them as a lost child. A lot of those are what they think is the descendants yes. of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of Ethiopian Jews. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for today. We're grateful for our nation. And Father, I pray for our country. I pray in Jesus' name that there would be a revival, that the love of Christ would be shared between people. And I ask, Lord, that uh, you'd bless every person in the room today and those that... Uh, are going to watch on YouTube. Father, I pray that you would protect them from this virus. I pray that you would protect their families and bless their businesses. 
And Lord, we ask that uh, you would be with those that have been mentioned for prayer. We know that prayer does change things. And we thank you that we have that gift. And we thank you for the gift of your Bible. And we never will understand everything until we get to heaven. Father, but we believe, and we believe, and it's accounted unto us as righteousness. We thank you for that. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Have a great week. Stay healthy.